Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. And today we're lucky enough to be joined by Seth Marth, who is currently analyzing at Forrester specifically for sales sales slash revenue ops, of course. Seth, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. And for, for the diehard fans of the show, you'll be aware that we've previously had one of the Forrester member on previously. And it was actually a live discussion in our office in London. And it was the feedback we got on that episode was incredible. It was illuminating. A lot of the conversation topics that come up anyway in discussion, we, were, we went a lot deeper into. And so we've got about four or five that we're going to do the same with today. But before that, Seth, can you just give us a little bit of background so we have some context for your expertise? Yes, absolutely. So I've been I've been around sales operations and working in this space for for twenty years. Started out in small business. I was fortunate to go in and and run operations for a small business when I when I came out of college. Transitioned over to Apple Computer, um, where I really got a feel for how technology could make a difference in business. And kind of leveraged that into my work at GE, where I was really given my first chance in sales operations. I took on a huge transformation in Europe, pulled that together, ran that sales operations team, and kind of continued on doing that through businesses in in diagnostic imaging, in healthcare, uh, in small private equity companies, a few different industries. So I've been doing that for the last 10, 15 years and now I have the opportunity to to work at, at Serious Decisions Forrester, which is really focused on helping a wide variety of, of clients in these same type situations that I've that I've worked in in the past. So, and and quickly before we jump into the first trend, what was the the driver behind shifting from industry and implementing into the the research? You know, it, it, it's it's really more around impact because the you're you're working in one job. There's two areas really. One's the impact that you can make kind of across a, a group of companies, and the other is just the general interest in understanding how do you further the cause of sales and sales operations. Because this role allows you both of those, so you get to dig into a wide variety of industries. And, and learn about businesses, what the struggles they have, and then compare it to the research we have to be able to help them come up with solutions. And then I, you get to take that knowledge and the knowledge that you have previously, go out, spend time and dedicate time to research and understand how do you progress and help better solve those problems in the future. So that was something that I, that I really liked about this role that, that has actually proved to be true. It's 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 a great kind of balance that you don't get in the day to day grind of being a sales operations person where you're just flat out all the time focusing on solving problems, helping the sales team, making a difference for the business. Totally makes sense. And now the, the first thing I want to discuss is a trend which we've been aware of for quite some time. We've actually come close to renaming the show based on the power of this wave that we're about to discuss, and that is this whole revenue operation thing. Can you share your latest thoughts about RevOps versus sales ops? Yeah, I mean, revenue operations is something that we're heavily focused on and continually evolving within our, our practice, and it's becoming more and more important. And, and that's largely driven by the buyers. Bu- buyers aren't there used to be kind of okay. Here's marketing's role, and here's sales role. Here's digital's role, and here's here's uh, the in-person role. And they kind of transitioned over, and it was nice and smooth. But the world doesn't work that way anymore. Buyers buy the way they want to, and they're going to call a salesperson at many different points in the journey, and they're going to ask for certain things and need things digitally at many different points. So it's very messy from that standpoint. So as, as a sales and marketing organization, in, uh, along with customer service, you kind of need to be aligned if you're going to be able to address that type of buyer because they're no longer following the pattern that allows you to be siloed. So organizations are seeing that to be successful, we need to kind of approach the customer with all the different tools aligned to addressing their needs and, and solving their problems. So that continues. That, that takes many forms. One in aligning with the buyer, the other is aligning your data because there's information across the entire spectrum of how you communicate with a with a customer, 
that all adds value at different stages. So aggregating that together is a competitive advantage when you're competing against other organizations. So this just, just, just kind of reinforces it. Having that, it's not really a structure, but having that alignment is critical to that. So expert opinion, should we rename the podcast? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, Depends on how many, I mean, it depends on the audience that's watching. There, there are a lot of sales operations is morphing in certain ways. Um, you're talking to a lot of leaders that are, that are doing that. I think eventually it'll evolve into something where it may make sense. Um, but as you speak to different sales operations leaders and start seeing how much they're delving into marketing data and how much customer service starts, you'll start seeing that morph over. I was, Fortunate in my last my last few roles, I I own sales, marketing, and customer service. It was just kind of all together, and that's just been the natural course of businesses. The the smaller ones that are just saying it just makes sense to do that. So for me, they they kind of came together. So as you as you start interviewing more and more people who are living in a world where sales operations isn't just sales, I think it become more relevant to to potentially move in that direction. Yeah, and now onto another line that is blurring, and this is the line between inside and outside sales. Why do you think that these two are coming closer together? Yeah, this is an interesting one, and it's very much been sped up by by what we've been dealing with with COVID nineteen. You know, the, there are tools out there that allow for very, very um, productive conversations beyond the in-person conversation. It used to be, you know, sales reps, you go in, you sell, and you sell in person, and that's that's the way you close the deal. Well, buyers are, they, they felt the same way. They wanted that interaction. That was the way you built relationships. But as people have become more comfortable with things like Zoom and things like texting and LinkedIn and, and all these other forms of communication, it's just kind of morphed to a point where doing a Zoom meeting is just as valuable to a, to a buyer as being in person. Well, well, nowadays, it's really the only way you could do it. So inside sales is now able to do similar things and companies are realizing that. So they, they used to be they would use that as kind of the farm system to try to push through newer people into into sales roles after they prove themselves. But now you're seeing it where most of the tools an inside salesperson would use are now being leveraged across any sales role. It totally makes sense. I mean, I, I see myself as not, not technologically advanced, but used to all of the new technologies, right? And so when I first... I, I've been exposed to sales relatively recently in the last two, three years. Mm-hmm. And so when I started learning about the difference between inside and outside sales, I couldn't really understand it because I, I always knew that an inside sales person could close deals using Zoom, et cetera. Yep. And so that's basically what you're saying. Technology is eradicating this the definition, basically. Yeah, I mean, the technology has been around for a while, but buyers are now open to it more. And, and it used to be, and, and to, to a certain extent, there's that, that, that relationship and in-person, that in-person component still matters, but it's right now it's a lot harder to do. It's actually, it isn't being done at all, so it can't matter, but over time it will again. But what you're seeing is just that, that acceptance level going up. And, and, and there's a cost side to it as well. The, the, the components that go into an inside sales, uh, into executing an inside sales role versus an outside sales are, are, are more efficient. You, you don't have the travel, you don't have different, different costs that go with that. So those things are kind of colliding together. You have buyers that are now more willing to, and, and now that they've been forced to do it, they're kind of seeing, well, it's not that I can kind of get what I need um, without having you try to, to, to come in and talk to me. So buyers are enabling it and companies are seeing the benefits of it. So it's just naturally starting to go in that direction. I think you'll see that progress even further over time. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free 
If you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID, that's ebster.com forward slash COVID. Got it. Now onto the, the kind of biggest buzzword in sales, AI, and specifically what companies are doing to prep for future applications of AI, but then also what AI is helping the businesses actually do and sell better with today. Yeah. So AI starts with the most boring component of, of most businesses, the one that nobody wants to talk to, and that's aggregation and kind of management of, of data. Um, the minute you talk to that in an executive boardroom, you see eyes glaze over and, and those types of things because it's, it's the non-sexy part of AI, but it's also the part that you can't do any of it without it. So you have to, in order to have AI function, which everyone wants to get into it, and you quickly realize, and we've seen this as well, is you may want to do AI, but you can't facilitate and execute AI unless you have accurate real-time data that allows, the, that allows your systems to facilitate it and, and analyze that information. And the power of that is very much about how fast you can put in accurate information in. So if, if I'm looking at an AI model and I'm able to feed it new information once a month, I only get 12 iterations of growth. But if I can feed it, if I can feed it once a day, now I'm getting 30, 365 iterations. So you can manage the impact and how fast you can learn and grow if you're learning 365 times in the same period rather than 12. And that type that increases even more when you're looking at it real time, and and you're starting to see that where some of the limitations of AI are are being seen when you just try to throw it onto a normal set of bad information or data that doesn't really work together or hasn't been structured properly or defined. Got it. Makes sense. And then m- moving forward, what what do you see is the core or the killer app or application for? AI in the future, let's say, when companies do have their data flow sorted? The the thing I see is is really around a term that we call dynamic guided selling. That's going to be that where AI augments the sales process. And it's not really going to be a killer app. It's going to be an aggregation of apps. And this is where we're at right now is you have lots of amazing companies that are doing things very much in silos where they're taking components. You have companies that are out there that are aggregating and eliminating the need for a sales rep to do activities by aggregating and analyzing it direct from calendars or direct from you guys do this stuff where, where, it's, where you can look at it and analyze it and come up with insights. But if you look across all the interaction points of the buyer, you'll find thousands of companies and, and multiple silos where that information isn't being aggregated together to get the full picture of a buyer. So I, I think when you see that killer app, it's going to be the person or the organization that can come in and aggregate every touch point of a buyer to be able to work alongside a sales rep and give them real-time feedback on the best way to handle it. So it's that partnership between AI and the sales rep that enables them to have all the information they need at the point they need it to best facilitate the buying process. And we, we, we call it dynamic guided selling. And I think that's a hugely exciting space for us. And in its area, we're doing a lot of research. And I think it's, it's going to be that next step to really push forward and take sales to the next level. Sure. Now, with everything we just said about how sales is changing, is this going to be, impact the way that businesses compensate sales reps? If yes, how do you see that changing and how should compensation structures change as well? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that today. When you, when you look at compensation, what, what you're seeing, especially when you get into uh, simple transactional sales, are, 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 there's, a, there's a hard push to either push that through a channel or through e-commerce. Ideally, through e-commerce is where a lot of them are going. Because if it's a transaction, buyers don't want to buy via a sales rep. They just want to be able to go somewhere and buy the order, buy, buy the quantity they need, what they need. Where sales is coming in is in the complex sales where they where they're adding a lot of value, helping the customer through it. But what we're seeing in those spaces is buyers don't buy 
in they buy in groups. They have they have large buying groups that are coming into in, into these deals with real analysis of what they want and real education. So you, you, as an individual sales rep, you can't really you, you have to bring your own team in that can really facilitate and, and answer those questions. But what that does is it muddies the buying pro- or the accountability process. So compensation is very easy in a world where you have have a sales rep that fully controls the sale and and is responsible for the win and the loss. So as you go into team sales, that accountability is becoming blurrier. And we're seeing that. You're seeing the edging up of base salaries and the dropping of at-risk salaries as these team sales become more prominent because you're asking sales to collaborate more rather than being kind of the, the, the one person going in to win the day. So compensation models are evolving in that way. I think you'll see that continue to evolve. But one thing that's happening on the periphery that will eventually come into compensation, and we're, we're seeing it as well, we're starting to see compensation being pushed deeper. So we talked about the revenue engine before. We're starting to see compensation being pushed deeper into the sales cycle where you're looking at marketing, you're looking at customer service, and you're starting to compensate them on triggers and on the, the area of responsibility that they have to the sales process. And as data becomes more visible and some of these engines start running and you can accurately see trigger points and things within the sales process that were that are maybe three steps away that are very hard to compensate today because they're not visible, you'll see I think you'll see a drive away from it, but then also a, a start to see a push back to it where you start compensating offering more at risk pay to pe- for people who are executing very very early in the sales process, but because you can compensate them now because now you have very clear understanding, a very clear understanding that that execution point is critical to the end result sale. And that's very new because it's always been very much focused on the sales rep and at the close, which is somewhat unfair, but it's also the only way you can really see it because it, 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 when you go deeper, it becomes less accurate. Got it. Makes sense. It seems like much is going to change with compensation or already is and is evolving yeah, with time. Very much uh, so. f- final area to discuss, um, something uh, that I've seen you guys talk about called dynamic sales planning. Uh, I, I think this has to do with how fast things are changing now and, and therefore how do you sales plan or sales operations plan for change? Yeah. Um, one of the other principal analysts, Robert Munoz, um, has worked heavily on this. And, and what, what it basically is, we did a presentation on it at, at, at Summit uh, a month ago. It's really around solving for the problem before the problem happens. In a lot of cases, you get businesses that most businesses spend a ton of time putting together a plan. And traditionally, you could put that plan together and implement it over the course of a year and your goal was to implement the plan. And, and you were successful if you could execute that really, really well. Well, businesses are changing quickly. Industries are changing quickly. I mean, you have situations that pop up. This year's a great example that cause um, dynamic shifts in how your business works. So instead of, it, it, instead of executing your plan rigidly, it's now moving to a world where you need to plan for change. So dynamic sales planning is really set up and the work we're doing around that is around how do you plan for change? How do you, how do you set things up in a big organization or a small organization that when the change happens, you can make very quick shifts because you've thought through the biggest risks in your business and had plans already ready, approved, execute, ready to execute. So when they happen, you can be quick on your feet and move. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that, that's, I think it's, it's becoming more and more important over time. Planning for change. Final question I'd like to ask is over the next five years, what is the, the one trend or the one, uh, concept that as a, that you would most advise a salesperson to be aware of the thing that's going to have the biggest impact on their role? Yeah. Be ready to be augmented. So a lot of times when people look at things like AI, they think of it as taking something from them. In reality, it's going to be adding something to them. 
So it's going to be giving them the skills and intelligence that a system or something that can ag- that can aggregate and look at across an entire spectrum of information and provide insights to you to be able to make you better. Um, so it's not a competing force. It's, an, it's a force that can work together. And for those who do that, they're really going to excel. For those who don't, they are going to be pushed out of... Be, uh, out of their roles because imagine competing against someone that's that's augmented with with AI that can have access to every bit of information that that you have in your company and give you insights to be able to go to a buyer with every interaction they've ever had and provide you support versus a sales rep who's walking in and just kind of winging just working off of their knowledge of what they know it's going to be very hard to compete in that world so preparing yourself as a sales rep to be augmented and supporting and driving towards that, the best are going to rise to the top that, that do that. Awesome. Seth, I think that was uh, an oddity of the, the change in sales ops. The, the one thing actually that has hit me from this discussion really is that the reason sales and sales ops is changing is because the buyer is changing. And we touched upon this on three different points, I think. Yeah. So RevOps a shift towards RevOps because buyers don't really like they're buying wh- wh- wherever they want. Um, inside and outside sales blurring because again, the buyer's changing. And then also with the compensation and more educated buyers coming with a pack and therefore how do you compensate a pack? And so I, I think we're at a very exciting time. And I also think we ended on quite a positive note uh, with your point about sales reps shouldn't be scared that their job, the AI is taking jobs, but the, that the AI is actually going to augment them and make them more effective. So Seth, thank Absolutely. you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom. Great to be here. Thanks for having me.